Leslie Peterson, I have 12 years of experience in the mental health field, including a wide range of neurodivergent experience. Um, we got more people come in and I'm going to let them come and sit. I think neurodiversity is something that is not spoken enough about, spoken about enough within the libertarian movement and it's a bit of a shame because we have so many neurodivergent individuals. So I'm very happy that I was asked to do this. I'm going to start with, who, who's seen X-Men? <laughs> yeah, those are great movies, right? Yeah. And who's seen X-Men 3, The Last Stand? Yeah. And <laughs> just a bit. Yeah, it was a bit rubbish. It, it was rubbish? Yeah, well, a bit rubbish. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry you think it was rubbish. I, I'm a, I love bad movies. But, <laughs> Like Sharknado, I'm ready for Sharknado 3. <laughs> and, and this talk's gonna be a little informal. I'm, I got my shoes off and I'm just kind of gonna walk around on stage. But in X-Men 3, The Last Stand, I think it's got a very important theme in it. In X-Men 3, we have the mutant community and they come together as a community. They are fighting against mainstream society for rights as a community. Mainstream society has tried to make them fit in, tried to force them into a mold of this typical person, somebody who hasn't mutated in some way. And I'm, I haven't seen the movie in a long time. I probably should have refreshed. I mean, there's nothing wrong with an X-Men binge, but they're trying, they're being forced to ID themselves, they're being forced to state how they're different from those around them. And I feel like this is an equivalent of what the neurodiversity movement is fighting against. The neurodiversity movement in its basic premise, the theory in its basic premise, is that we have things such as the autism spectrum and learning disorders that as a movement are fighting against this idea that they are disordered from mainstream in some way, that they are not like the rest of us being neurotypical. They want to be respected as just a different way of viewing things, not a bad way, a wrong way, or a dysfunctional way, just a different way. And I feel like this is equivalent to, of course, X-Men. <laughs> Um, in this, we have a wide variety of rights that are being fought for. The neurodiversity movement started with the autism rights movements. It started with Asperger's and high-functioning autism people wanting respect not as a disorder but as a different viewpoint, as a different as a different neurological set, nothing more. But it has grown, and controversially, it has grown to include other things such as the Mad Rights Movement, which is an anti-psychiatry movement. And I'm going to try to stay away from that until <laughs> questions. I know some of you may have a question about that. And I can actually take questions at any time. We're not going to leave it to the end because I want to keep it a little informal. And I see Caitlin over there. <laughs> Caitlin Elizabeth. I'll give you my... I'm, I should have told you that I was going to take questions throughout it. I'm sorry. Okay, so what about... I, I don't really know too much about the neurodiversity movement. Um, you said that it's about people who want to be seen as just like having a different mode of thinking that's not worse or better. Um, is there like a 
a component in there for like mental health awareness where like the idea that um, like if you have a mental illness and you recognize that it's a mental illness and you're fighting for the idea that that's not your fault you know like that mental illnesses are uh, are, are like physical illnesses that way or is it or is there not or is that not like part of it that was you, you kind of went in two directions with that um, that is mental illness is kind of touched on with mad rights being incorporated into the neurodiversity movement um, within the mad rights you have this idea that it's not a mental illness isn't really an illness but again a different mode and that you need to adjust yourself and your environment and that this is not necessarily a bad thing to adjust your environment um, and then the other direction it kind of went is and this is more of a mental health question than a neurodiversity question and that's okay um, that mental health is a very biological thing and almost the entirety of the, of the mental health industry, the mental health complex would say that it is a biological thing if not partly a biological thing. Um, the approach that most people take is a biopsychosocial approach, meaning that there are multiple components to mental health. The neurodiversity movement is primarily a biological approach movement, meaning that they believe there this, these different neurological structures and not necessarily modes, but different divergences. I'll get to explaining that later. Are biological and not a social aspect. You, somebody is born autistic, they're not made autistic from vaccines or such. <laughs> yes, we had one question back there and then I'll be with you. Sure. Uh, let me see if I can get the mic over here. Okay, thank you. That's what I've been trying to do. Uh, be careful, be careful. Yeah, that's yep, good. We're good, we're good. Yes. Okay, so you mentioned you mentioned that uh, you felt that, um, well, not that you felt, but certain people feel that uh, people should have mad rights, that um, even that brain chemistry isn't something that we should persecute and, you know, lock up in mental health hospitals and stuff. Uh, I wanted to know if you could go into how, um, instead of that, uh, you know, the mental health prison life that we send uh, those people into right now, is there another way to uh, has there been any thought done as to how well is to raise them into being a proper mad person? If that makes sense, you know? Fully developed. A proper mad person. I haven't heard that. Um, yeah, the mad rights movement does have this idea, um, and I'm going to use the perfect example of schizophrenic, um, schizophrenia and related disorders that these were not disorders until fairly recent in our human history, that they have been viewed as, that the individuals with schizophrenia or related disorders have been viewed as special or touched in some way, um, touched by God or a spiritual being in some way, um, that their unique view of the world and their unique perceptions and sensory experiences grant them some different understanding and a lot of the mad rights movement kind of embraces that saying that it's not a bad thing they just have a unique view and a lot of them are very anti-psychiatry when it comes to no medication they would rather learn to live with it a great example of this and not saying that he was anti-psychiatry but John Nash eventually learned to differentiate between his hallucinations in real life and he learned just to ignore them or that they were a symptom of something that was going on and he would respond in a way that didn't exasperate, exasperate 
his other symptoms, but that he wasn't shutting it out completely, that it was something he needed in his life. So that is one way of doing it. Yeah, so I'd like to uh, pick your brain on uh, this sort of uh, sort of the thing that I talk about, I get on my soapbox every now and then when these topics come up. So the, the, basically like the DSM and disorders and that, the, the connotations of, with that word. So uh, I think there's a lot of uh, dysfunctional behaviors and less than ideal, behavior, whatever you want to call it, that greater than 50% of the population has. Like one example that always comes to mind is say, like a bunch of people are in a building, whatever the context is, and there's like a, a fire alarm and it, there doesn't seem to be any like emergency and a lot of people will look around and nobody will get up until the first one or two or three people gets up and and that sort of thing there's sort of like this kind of there's things like that that way over half the population has that you know that sort of thing could lead to some sort of calamity that people, you know there's sort of this sort of herd like behavior that's just one thing that comes to mind right away there's plenty of others of uh, like non-ideal sort of uh, modes of thinking and that doesn't get labeled a disorder because more than 50 uh, fifty percent of the population has it. So it seems to be, the DSM seems to be a crock just on those grounds alone. <laughs> and so, yeah, and so um, I basically would just like to say, I mean, I have almost uh, as much disrespect for the DSM as I do for the you know, state. And so I just want to get your reaction to that. Like it's just some arbitrary thing that these like self-appointed experts like it's kind of like this fascist thing that they only, if, if you're, if it's something that's allegedly less than, like non-optimal, and it's like 10% or 5, 15 has it, then it gets labeled disorder. There's plenty of dysfunctional, like stupid shit that like 70 or 80% of the population does, and it doesn't get labeled disorder. Yes. That's basically. Um, and this is, your, your statement seems to start with a basic flaw. And I'm just gonna say this that the percentage of the population that holds this view of mode of thinking, that has no impact on whether it's in the DSM or not. That is not a thing. <laughs> and this is a common misconception, and a lot of people hold that idea. But a, the qualifications for something to be in the DSM and for somebody to be labeled with a disorder as such, oh, it's been a while since I've taken abnormal. <laughs> But the, the basic premise is that it impacts their life in a negative way. Now, this is where the neurodiversity movement comes in, and they say that these disorders that they have been labeled with do not actually impact their life in a harmful way. Your example of people in a, in a building, um, that is actually just the group mentality is either useful or... Disuse, or disuse in dis, disuseful in some context. That's not actually a strong enough, that's not a disorder, and it's not a disordered event, because it could be helpful. There's plenty of context for like, eight, like quote unquote AD, or AD, quote D, or whatever, whatever, OCD is, is useful, and that's not and, just, you know what I mean? And it could be useful, and there, in within the DSM and within the mental health community, there is this idea that we can have tendencies. Um, I could have a tendency for OCD behaviors. Um, I do get a little obsessive. I do get a little compulsive, but it's not to the point where it impacts my life in a detrimental way. I'm sure that if somebody else with a different set of morals and values thought the way I did, about, like had these impulses and obsessions and compulsions, that they may feel it impacted their life in a negative way. And that is a very large part of diagnosis that unfortunately with modes like autism or learning disorders, this is, these are diagnosed so young that the person is not able to say whether it impacts their life in a detrimental way. What it is is the school says it impacts their life in a detrimental way because they have not adjusted to what a neurotypical child needs in order to succeed. Now, one of the things I'm going to suggest is that we, and the, one of the things that I'm going to suggest and the neurodiversity movement suggests is that we, 
adapt around children instead of making children adapt to the environment. And this is this is the basic premise. I, I know I see all the Aspies up front. <laughs> Uh, so if you could point to something, you say in the DSM, that 70, 80, 90 percent of the population has, then I'll retract what I said earlier. But I, um, maybe I'm wrong. I could be wrong. I just, quite frankly, I don't think there's anything in there that over half the population is in. I, I could totally be, okay. wait, I could be way I, off. I'm mean, just curious. The, the DSM and diagnostic criteria are set up in a way such that the only way to give a diagnosis that it impacts their life in a negative way. Now, so many of us may have depressive, we may look at the list of diagnostic criteria for depression and be like, we have this, this, and this. We have three out of five of the things. Be like, okay, we could be depressed. But it's not impacting our life in a negative enough way for it to actually be a disorder. These tendencies can and often are in all of us for at least the basic mental illnesses. Um, when you, we get to such diverse modes like learning disorders or autism spectrum, then it may not apply to everybody. But the mental illness and the mad rights, we all do and we all can exhibit these things. So these the, requiring 75 or 80 percent is just unreasonable. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm curious if you've heard of and what your thoughts are on the Icarus Project, which is a um, sort of a collective of uh, people with mental illness or people who self-identify as mad and uh, have sort of a sort of a similar, I think that they fall within the mad rights movement, but I'm not exactly sure. They, they were the start of the mad rights. Yeah, okay, fair enough. So that was just my question, if you had heard of them and, and what you yeah. thought about them. Oh, okay. Um, my question is, what do you think of the people who use Aspie as an insult? Not just Aspie in general. I know you weren't doing it. I know. I, I, I know you saw. I'm not, I, I saw your face when I said I, that. I, I yeah. Um, on okay. Yeah. I'm not talking about people who use Aspie for its descriptive purposes or its like teasing purposes. They only use it for its insulting purposes. Like all those people in Keen are Aspies, for example. Like what I see that insult so much in like the libertarian movement and what can we do to get people to stop using Aspie as an insult? Well, I don't know if you heard here yesterday there was a wonderful talk on con conceptualizing and it was talking about how labels and words are descriptive, not prescriptive. And I think one of the things that we're running into is that we're using it prescriptively, saying, oh, that's, that's bad. We're adding that connotation to it. Um, we need to step back. Like any other slur, we need to just say that it's a word, it describes a group of people, and then take the connotation away. It's reclaim it. Um, as so many people were upset about gay becoming a slur, <coughs> or queer becoming a slur or a slut. Just reclaim it and take the power away from them. It's, that's the only, that, that is my solution. And I know it may not work for everybody. Like, there's nothing I can do to reclaim Aspie because it's not a label for me. I get, I, like I can reclaim queer, but, yeah. I, and I do, but like I don't know how to help my friends who have the, the, who are like on the spectrum and hear Aspie used as an insult. It just strikes me as so irritating when people I, do that. I'm gonna let somebody who's actually <laughs> Aspie answer that because I'm nervous. I'm not functioning. <laughs> <laughs> so, we had the debate of Fed or Aspie recently from someone who loves us, someone who does love us in the community. Mm, I'm 30 year old, 30 years old today. I am from the generation. I'm from the generation that was not labeled Aspie or any kind of ad. Girls can't be autistic. <laughs> Girls can't be autistic and whatever. And I'm also uh, OTD. I'm an old school oppositional defiance. Uh, so. Welcome to the libertarian movement. Yeah. <laughs> You're among friends now. 
Oh yeah. <laughs> Why do you think I was fine with you ten years ago when News Nine said? So we were decided that the Free State Project is Free Estate. That was News Nine. And uh, so I was lucky to be trained as someone who they knew they couldn't do anything for me other than these faces mean this. Here you go. <laughs> My Aspie superpowers and my high-functioning, like, autism superpowers, this is why I can do security. <laughs> so, there you go. Rangers lead the way. Aspie superpowers. I was actually going to say something anyway. Um, yeah, and did you want to say something? I didn't want to... I mean, I, I unfortunately don't have an answer for you. Um, there is very little we can do to make somebody else not be hurt by a word. Um, unfortunately, this comes down to emotional libertarianism. They need to decide themselves, and maybe you can talk to them and help them embrace the term, but they need to decide for themselves that that word unfortunately holds no power over them. And I know it's hard, because I've been a victim of bullying, so I, I, I feel it, but I don't feel it on the word Aspie. So just work on emotional libertarianism with them. So, um, sorry. Sorry, so, I know there's so many of you who have questions. Yeah, um, I, I wanted to say too, I wasn't even going to mention that thread, but since Tara, Tara mentioned the thread, <laughs> uh, one thing I like to do, one, one thing I like to do, and a few people come up to me or my private message, private message me on Facebook and thank me for doing it, is that I call people out when they do this kind of stuff because even though I'm apparently no fun allowed, um, <laughs> Because I call people out every now and then when they're acting like dicks. Um, sorry, family program. Um, when they're acting like jerks. Um, you know, it's that's what I feel like I can do. Um, there was this comment on a YouTube video about um, somebody was talking about Asperger's and somebody said, well, my friend was had Asperger's and was a dick. So basically saying, therefore, all people with Asperger's have, are, are basically like jerks. And I was like, but that doesn't make any sense just because one person... Anyway, so that's kind of like what what I feel like people should do is that like I, I don't um, necessarily advocate calling calling people out all the time, but um, that's one thing that I would say to um, what Sabri always said. And I, I want to talk about how this ties back into the libertarian movement. Um, we, we talked about how the neurodiversity movement wants people to be viewed as non-disordered just because of their unique view on the world. I firmly believe that this ties back into the liberty movement because we, we're, we're all here because we share one thing. We are very liberty-minded. And the research that I've read has shown that the, this is something that we all seem to have grown up with. We have all been very aware, not all, but the majority of us have been all very aware of liberty and freedom, even without the name of it, but we felt it from an early age. I, this is my personal pet theory, please don't place this on the neurodiversity movement. My personal pet theory is that being liberty minded is a new neurodivergent path that is coming about in society. Maybe not really new, it's been a couple hundred years, but it is something that is coming about. It is obviously growing because this entire thing is growing. Um, and we need to, just like with the autistic and the learning disabilities and the rest of the neurodiversity movement, we don't need to shape them to the environment, we need to shape the environment to them. So we need to actively shape the world around us for our liberty mindset by doing politics and activism and all these other things, just like we actively shape the environment around anybody who is neurodivergent, instead of trying to force them into that nice little neurotypical box. So, I will take a few more questions. I don't have a lot more time. Apparently, I ramble. <laughs> yes? Just a comment I wanted to throw in. When I yeah. was first diagnosed, um, it seems that the majority of the attention for autism at the moment is on children. But there's an enormous number of adults being diagnosed late time. Uh, well, because that's a okay, give me let him finish the question, please. Sorry. Um, the 
the challenge when I was diagnosed as basically 50 years old with autism uh, was so this is an entirely different way of mental processing and perceiving and I've been dealing with all my life with no one who acknowledges it's there. So it's been 50 years dealing with an elephant living that I couldn't name, but it wouldn't go away. And so then it was a question of, so how do I compensate? autism and autism spectrum disorders is so recent that we have yet to come up with a myriad of ways to adapt the environment for the individual instead of adapting the individual for the environment. You have been forced all your life with, that, with no knowledge of what was going on and why it differed to adapt yourself to the environment. We just haven't caught up. The, the neurotypicals haven't caught up on a way to adapt the environment for you. special ed classes and teachers who are familiar with autism spectrum disorders do try to teach the children early on so that they can communicate with neurotypical individuals a lot easier and it is something that it seems functioning adults with autism spectrum disorders have learned to do on their own hopefully this this is the, and hence the high functioning qualifier that I put on there. So, so hopefully that is something that you have learned. I have a high IQ. I was in a doctoral program, but I got to the point where the university didn't want to deal with me because I would ask them specifically, "What are you talking about?" And they couldn't be specific. All they had was vague generalities, and I didn't know what they were talking about. Yeah. Yes. One last question. It sounds like basically in a world where he was a majority and he was a minority, they would be the disordered ones. And it's just some fascist thing to and what people have with and that there's this, this DSM apologetics where, mind you, homosexuality was a disorder because it was, they didn't have to be And, that, and that's what the neurodiversity movement is trying to do, is to convince mainstream society that, I, I know I'm almost at the end, I know, I know, teach mainstream society that that is simply divergent and not disordered. The, the point of the word disorder is that it doesn't fit in or it makes day-to-day -day life difficult for that person. Well, we, we have, so yeah. Is this a number no, we, if 80% of the population had diabetes, it would still, it would be, still be a diabetes. disorder. Because it well, makes you can life off, if difficult. If 80% of people were ADD, everything would be shaped around that, or OCD or what have you. And, and that is the point. We need to shape the environment for the individual, not the individual for the environment. Disorders are, we use the term disorder when somebody has a difficult time with their environment. And we only do that in order to give them tools to better deal with their environment. But it sounds like when you say it that way that you're apologizing for, like apologetics for... I'll apologize for it's, it's not my label. It's I am, not perfect, but it's a necessary tool. I am up here speaking objectively. I am not claiming that I am on one side or the other. I am just trying to explain what the movement and the theory says. But if there is bigotry, that should be addressed too. Okay. <laughs> yes, bigotry should always be addressed. So. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah this is should, the absolute last really... question. I'm sorry. I know you were staring at me. <laughs> Wait, so you have, do you have to like go early? Yeah, the, the absolute last question. I was told I had very little time left. You, you gave me the. <laughs> you wouldn't like. Much like I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, well then we got time for more questions. Sorry, awesome. I like that statement then. What are you doing, man? <laughs> okay. Oh, you're like 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Leslie, sorry. do you yes. mind? Yes, yes. If I get up? Yeah. What do we do? Yes. So, many things have come across the human spectrum. If autism was not a part of the general superpowers of being human, it would have already been we know by now. If it was a problem, it would have been weeded out. If you don't care what your other like cave mates are doing, you can hunt your own shit. You can be personally responsible for yourself. Um, I'm sorry. I've been neurally non-diverse for my whole life. Um, the public school I was in did not be, they were not able to teach me how to read until like sixth grade. They could not figure me out. They taught me how to read human emotions by facial recognition. That's the only way I know how to do life. Um, I'm fine with my superpowers, and I'm fine with the X-Men, yeah. <laughs> um, I would prefer if people did not use it as an insult, but if we did not have a place for this, it would have already been gone from human society. You weed out many things by genetics, this is fine. <laughs> I'm going to bring something up, um, and I meant to talk about this earlier, and then we got distracted with all these questions, you guys had more questions than I had talking points, but um, can we think back to Darwin and his origin of species? We have a small island, and that is the human population. We have some individuals who have adapted to their environment, and then we have some individuals who have found tools to adapt their environment for them. Um, I don't know how long and how much of Origin of Species you guys read, but there were some birds who used tools to make up for the differences between the, the islands that they were on and the differences in the environments that they were within. So all that I'm saying is that the neurodiversity movement and theory st says that we need to adapt this environment and we need to help adapt the environment around people and individuals who have not adapted to the environment we are forcing upon them. The neurotypical is the majority, and I would rather just say neuro-majority, but that is not the nomenclature being used in the movement. So, um, the neuro-majority needs to work and help the neuro-minority. That's all. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Would it be more helpful to look at it as a linguistic challenge rather than as an intellectual cognitive challenge? In what way? The, it seems to me that most of the problems of physics run into are about trying to communicate something across, whether it's through symbols or drawings or words or whatever. <laughs> And those who begin to understand a particular autistic's way of communicating, it's almost as if they have a language that no one else knows. And they get along fine. Because they know the assumptions, the expectations, the definitions that when, that person's language brings around. Yeah. When we are speak speaking those terms. When we speak specifically of the autism rights, the uh, when we speak specifically of autism spectrum disorders being the neurodivergence of that particular neurodivergence, then yes, that is an, a, a useful way of talking about it, but autism spectrum is not the only neurodivergence out there. There are other learning disorders that are not linguistic. There are other emotional disorders that have nothing to do with linguistics. We need to shape the environment around every divergence as we come across it. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, I'm just curious about whether you think neurodiversity is really the right term because uh, I'm not hearing much discussion of biology or cell function. I'm hearing, I think, psychodiversity would be a much more apt term. So my question is ultimately within the movement or the way you view it, 
Uh, do you think of things in terms of like Skinnerian behavioral context or a Freudian post Freudian object relationist perspective or an actually neurological, biological perspective, which doesn't speak about behaviors or conditions or things at all? Do you mean, do you mean like more like neural connections? Of yes. That um, like to talk about the oh. I'm just having like a more of like a more Okay. So. Okay. Um, let's go back to X Men. Yeah. Let's go back to X Men. Um, some X Men, their mutations were cellular. Some X Men, their mutations were functional, and yeah, yeah, there, there, it wasn't. There, there is a distinction. Um, some of them, their cells changed. Le, the what's her, what's her name? They're who who changed colors? Mystique. They're not real. Th this is an analogy. <laughs> this is an analogy. <laughs> for, for all you Aspies and Audis, this is an analogy. Mystique's cellular structure changed. But, and magnetocellular structure changed, but... Rogue. Rogue, Rogue. Which one's Rogue? She's the one that absorbs the power. Absorbs. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, she wears the gloves, you can't touch people because then she takes their energy or power away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Actually, I was going to go with Storm. No. So, Storm's okay. mutation dealt with energy, not her cellular structure. Right, but this analogy is not apt because no, our it is, it is, it like is that. because there are different divergences. Not every divergent is neurological structures. Not every divergence is the emotional so psycho. What's it made of? Where does it live? It's not made of cells in the brain. The okay. this is a way more complicated okay. issue that I will talk to you about okay. when we're outside because I don't want to throw too much jargon at everybody. Okay. Yes? I, I just I just wanted to mention that I don't know if there's been any discussion about um, neurological issues as far as people who have had brain tumors or things like that and where that goes. The biological, the genetic cause of those things and how those people are affected before they know and then after they know and then you know, whatever treatment they may encounter. Yeah. Um, I haven't spoken about that because generally that doesn't fall under the neurodiversity movement. Um, neurodiversity movement tends to focus on things, particular modes and divergences, particular differences from an individual like birth, how they differ from the majority of individuals like autism spectrum disorders or learning disabilities. Um, that is a different set of psychology. But it actually, it actually, some some of these people, they it's a because it's a genetic, and they don't know. A lot of people don't know they even have it. How does that fall into the whole perspective of, I guess, no. Uh, the it it is not clear. Okay. Um, they don't specifically talk about that within the movement. It is not. I've never seen it included in the theory, but we can talk about it later. Yes? Um, you use the language several times, we need to shape the environment. And so I'm just wondering if that's your opinion or if that's mad um, a, a, a opinion. But also, as far as shaping the environment, it kind of sounds like a positivistic attitude to take. And the state shapes the environment and distorts the environment. Whereas someone who may have um, mental capabilities that are outside the norm, right, um, where those capabilities would actually have more value and be valued if they're discounted in that, in that situation. So I'm wondering what you mean as far as we need to shape the environment versus one, if you take away the state that is actually shaping the environment, that's causing distortion, which is different than the individual and those that care about that person and the individual's expressed wishes on shaping the environment so it better suits that individual, right? That's a different type of, of, of attitude. I'm trying to figure out where what you're saying when we need to shape the environment. What do you mean by that? The, a wonderful, simplistic way to shape the environment, and I'm going to use this example, is Quite recently, I found this wonderful type font made by an individual with dyslexia. Yeah. And it is weighted differently. They have 
they have shaped the letters slightly differently so that somebody else with, with dyslexia, like they would not be as apt to switch letters when they interpret it. Um, it. It holds it down, it weighs it down for them when they read it. So these are simple things that we can do to shape the environment. And that, that's what I mean. Um, make adaptions, make... Um, um, service dogs are one way we can shape the environment. Weighted vests for people with sensory disorders are one way to shape the environment. Um, things like this, they're adaptive. So you're speaking of strictly voluntary yes. measures? Yes, all, all voluntary. I do not want anything with the state. <laughs> so I was, this was trying not to be a political talk. I know. Uh, well, I guess it's just stand up. Um, so I've used the um, the X Men analogy, um, and I'm not sure if you explicitly stated this, but I'm gonna explicitly state it anyway. Um, is one reason for it is that in during the X Men and, and a lot of the TV shows and movies, the comics, or whatever, there's always people who want to cure the X Men or the mutants of their diseases or their mutations. This is yeah. So this is a super important part of why this analogy totally works because there are literally people who want to cure, quote unquote, <laughs> what? I'll take it now. Yeah. I'll take it, I know where you're going. Okay. Um, so, the neurodiversity movement got its beginning in the anti-cure movement, of uh, the autistic rights movement. Um, there are organizations such as, such as Autism Speaks that raise money and fund research to find a cure for all levels of functioning autistics. They want to find a genetic cure. Many people with moderate to high level autism feel like that this is insulting to their way of life and to who they are. They do not view themselves as needing to be cured. That is the entire point of the neurodiversity movement, that this is not a disorder, this does not hurt them, this does not hurt anyone around them. Now this is not the viewpoint of everybody who is autistic, but this is the viewpoint of the theory and the movement that they do not or should not be cured of whatever disorder we have diagnosed them with or have labeled them with. So, yes? So, I mean, yeah, just to chime in with what Nick said here, uh, I mean, sometimes it sounds like the people who want to quote cure, say, uh, you know, the world of the, you know, cure people like this gentleman. It's like they want, they want a society where everybody's like Homer Simpson, where they just want these, they want people to, you know, to have an IQ around 100 and just not question, the, you know, just accept statism, whatever, what have you. Um, because there are certainly are correlations, and it sounds like they, they don't want to uh, roll with independent, intelligent, rational people. Because there, there is a strong correlation. So it's like they're anti-progress in a sense. Um, I, I feel like that is putting an intent on them that they may not necessarily see. This is an unintentional thing that they're doing. Or it's but, an expression of anger. But I feel like the reason they, they want to hear is because they see so much difficulty and they feel like this difficulty should be cured in this direction, should be fixed in this direction by a cure. Instead of adapting the environment, they're trying to adapt the people to the environment. They, a lot of, not, I don't want to put an intent in them, in the people behind this idea of a cure, but I feel like they approach this that if you're not neurotypical, if you don't fit into this typical box, that you could not possibly lead a happy, healthy life. Um, because of them. Because it's of like, them. Yeah. But they don't. It's like, they stop, don't. stop being gay. I, I hate gay people, so stop being gay. Because they're bigots like me. So, like, you should just tell those people to go fuck themselves. I mean, it's condescending, and so. It, it is condescending. The neurodiversity movement, the autistic rights movement, the mad rights movement, they all view the idea of a cure as very condescending. 
they do because they do not view themselves as needing to be fixed. They do not view it as a disorder and that's the very basis of that. I don't want to place intent where there is no intent, but there are unintentional consequences such as this feeling of condescension. Yes, because it's easy to predict and it's easy to get along and it's easier to think about if we don't have to use this high level of empathy to understand where another person is coming from. If they have the same background, if they have the same mode of viewing the world as we do, then we don't have to put too much effort into it. But I am calling on all of us as being liberty-minded people in my view, a unique neurodivergence to empathize with other neurodivergent groups so that we can be allies and help fight back against this idea that everybody needs to fit into a little box. Because we sure as hell don't want to be in a status box, do we? It's easy to be a statist, right? Like, we, I'm, I mean, I'm sure they all think like that, right? <laughs> we. We need to empathize, as hard as that is, but we need to empathize. Any other questions? Yes? Um, did you hear about some of the, the new flu that's going around, pushing like dangerous false cures, like new channels for kids who want to Say that again. Did you hear about some of the new flu that's been going around, false cures? No, that's, that's horrible, and there will always be misinformation about a very many number of things. Um, there were cures for homosexuality. Um, I live in North Carolina. Just the other week I was at work and I had to print up a bunch of flyers for a pray away the, way, pray away the gay support group. I, I was appalled that we still had these. Like, there, there will always be false cures for things, for different people to make them not different. There will always be that. And it's sad, but all we can do is spread help, helpful information, accurate information, and spread empathy. And that's all we can do. Anything else? Yes. To me, it comes back to inclusivity. Um, yes. So when I plan an sure. event and I have diversity of friends I want to invite, I have to choose if any of this wheelchair accessible or my friend Paul could come. I have to have either voice interpreters or braille available. Or my friend Jean couldn't relate. Uh, I mean, the more people you know with, with different disabilities and the more you know them as individuals and what they need in order to relate to everyone else in the room, the more you can create a social space where Everybody's more or less equal. This is going back to shaping the environment for the people and yeah. not shaping the people for the environment. Yeah. Someone uh, told me in certain contexts I don't look very autistic. And I said, well, if you, if you meet a blind person in their own home, they don't look very blind until you move all the furniture. Yeah. Then they have a problem. Yeah. Um, and this goes back to this idea of invisible illnesses. While these not, may not be illnesses, it is invisible to somebody on the outside. It is your perception of reality, and like there, there are no physical indicators that somebody is neurodivergent, that they view the world in a different way, unless you're in their head. You have no idea how they view the world. But if you get to know them as an individual, yeah. you know what their abilities and their limitations are. Okay. Because you're showing and, that to somebody. And what? Because you're showing it to them. You're showing it to them. I, I guess I don't understand what you mean by that. Um, yeah. I just wanted to. Yeah, I got it. I got it. I got it. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Going to be helpful. Yeah, that for once.
I probably actually should have been doing this throughout the talk, but decided to be helpful now. Here you go. I just wanted to interject about his point about you don't show it to someone. There's a lot of people that probably have some sort of neurodiverse type difference. <laughs> Diverse Neuro difference. Neurodiverse type. Yeah, right. They, they, they don't want to express it to other people. They don't want anybody to know about it. And so Are they... Trying to hide it? No, I think that they just, it's maybe something it's they personal. feel it's personal. And they want to deal with it themselves in their own way. In their own way. So they try to hide it. Well, you can you could take it that way. Yeah, yeah, you could take it that way. Um, but there are a lot of people that do that. They feel that they're maybe shunned by the community if they bring that point up, whether it be some kind of health thing, whether they were born with it, whether it's something that happened to them as a result of growing up and through life. But um, they do learn to hide it. So is that what you're trying to say? or? When I was first diagnosed, one second. Thank you. Sorry, this is an annoying process. <laughs> Maybe this should have been like a campfire talk. Um, yeah, this is informal. Sorry. When I was first diagnosed, it was months before I could find another gay man who was autistic because um, the autism had made them all agoraphobic. You know, because everything was overwhelming, they all stayed home and nobody went anywhere, so there wasn't any way to try to develop myself socially, uh, you know, with someone who understood my experience. Um, yeah, a lot of the autism context I was reading about, it, it kept talking about familial support and what the parents do and what the brothers and sisters do. I've been estranged from my family for over 30 years because they have no place in their lives from an openly gay person. So I have to do autism and gayness all by myself, which is where the only anger I have in the world is my is my service dog. Um, but I I don't know that I've ever been good about being closeted or, or hiding anything. But um, I guess the only option I would really have would be like the others to become more agoraphobic and simply stay home because when I stay home, it's life is not exhausting. And it's not overwhelming, and I can create an autism-friendly environment. And this goes back to the main theme that I'm trying to push here, is we need to adapt our environment. The neurotypicals need to adapt the environment to include everybody who is divergent. Yeah. Everybody well, who is a minority. Which, in relation to the workplace, there's a huge percentage of the workplace that is socially oriented. And there's a lot of employers who do not make their social interactions optional. And, and that if is you have to be there and you can't handle the situation because it's overwhelming, they wind up eliminating the autistic person in order to stabilize the work environment. And that is unfortunately something that does happen. Um, I, um, is it okay, babe? Yeah. Um, yeah, um, I work at a um, convenience store and I have, I have high function high functioning autism and it's uh, one of the jobs I get my partner was telling me who also has autism that Temple Grandin I guess does not recommend well, retail in general does not recommend for autistic people because there's so much socializing it's very overwhelming you have to deal with a lot of long-term memory um, so a lot of the time I feel like I'm just keeping my head above water there's also everyday situations where um, the the big the big owls uh, stand thing it said uh, surface hot I thought it meant that the counter was service hot, even though that clearly does not make any sense upon reflection. <laughs> but they meant the food was surface hot. Um, so this is kind of some, some of the challenges, I guess, that that um, other autistic people have is that they take something stuff very, very literally. Um, there was a bottle. I'm not gonna. Just one more example is just there was like a bottle of apple or it said apple juice on it, and even though it didn't look anything like it, I totally thought it was apple juice. Okay. <laughs> um. One little part, one neurodivergence that I think Will in particular really like is who knows their Meyer Briggs type. What about the first two letters? Does that kind of remember only part of it? Who knows whether they're introverted or extroverted? <coughs> this is the difference between people, right? We did we 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 diverged. I mean, 
Raise your hand if you're extroverted. <laughs> Who raised your hand if you're an introvert? Wow, I'm the minority right now. I, wow, wow. <laughs> Let's build the environment around her. <laughs> well, well, we did. Well, we did. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. We, we we built this environment around me, and a lot of a lot of people think that a lot of the world is built around extroverts. The, the retail and a lot of workplaces are built around extroverts. Um, but when I get home and I go on my computer and I, I get into a chat room or something. I go on Tumblr, please don't judge me. <laughs> I go on Tumblr, I get a lot of introversion thrown at me. A lot of people who are introverted use that space a lot more than I do as a way to adapt the environment around themselves. They, they use it as a way of communication because it is not adapted for them like the outside world. Um, they are adapted for that. And this goes one way or the other. You adapt the environment or the environment adapts you. Um, I think the digital era, not just for introverts, but for many other neurodivergent groups is a wonderful thing. You're, it, there's a lot of digital apps, there are a lot of um, websites, there's a lot of aids that are coming out that are digital that are going to help and that I've already seen help neurodivergent individuals interact with neurotypical individuals and I think it's a wonderful thing to see technology fixing this problem for us or at least working towards fixing this Problem. I'd like to dovetail on what you just said about technology being good for like neurodiverse people. So I had this thought, and uh, just for a full disclosure, I've never been diagnosed, but some people say, oh, I'm an HFA because I'm nerdy, I have nerdy esoteric interests. So I don't know what I, all I know is that there are, I think that there may be a, HFA and so forth may be real in a sense that there's different type, there's clearly an identifiable type of person. I don't want to call that a disorder. And in fact, I, some people say, well, it could be the next stage of human evolution. And, and so what you just said, what, yeah, right. So um, I, I had this one uh, long uh, kind of whimsical thought on Facebook a few months ago. I had a status update and Steve here saw it and a few other people may have seen it. Basically, uh, perhaps there's almost like an unconscious evolution where you start with people like Newton, who probably, you know, like he was never diagnosed because he's dead, but, um, you know, he, he kind of implied in his later years that he was a virgin or something, he didn't directly so he kind of implied it, so on, and he was quirky, so maybe he was HFA. Anyways, uh, so he started a modern technological era with, you know, modern physics and so forth, and other people who are probably ASPE or what have you, and then so that's caused, that's caused this technological era, and then now in the last 50 or so years, you have a lot of ASPE type people promoting libertarianism, and so the combination of these two things, one, technology and technological unemployment and two, on the other, uh, coming from the other direction, you have people promoting the end of the welfare state. And so perhaps that will sort of uh, cause a waning of the NT population. So technological unemployment and then the support of the welfare state being kicked out from under them, they'll be, they'll be, they won't be, uh, have, the numbers will go down and so forth. It's just a way reasonable thought I had as possible how it could go down. I don't know what will happen that way, but it's just an interesting thought. Maybe so. I know I'm very much a minority in this group, so. <laughs> being a neurotypical and extroverted. And thank you guys for letting me talk. We are, we are way over time.